In this lecture, we will um, look at uh, semantic segmentation uh, with deep learning, uh, which attempts to segment the images into um, regions that belong to uh, a particular class. We already saw um, a form of semantic segmentation in a previous lecture um, using uh, clustering techniques like uh, k-means. And today we will see how we can tackle this uh, with a deep learning approach. So we'll specifically talk about um, um, how we can approach the problem of semantic segmentation uh, with deep learning. What are the differences between um, a single label classification for the whole image? We will see some components that we have to introduce into a deep uh, learning network, like uh, encoder-decoder architectures, some new layers, uh, some different and more specialized loss functions, and the metrics used to evaluate uh, deep semantic segmentation uh, methods. And we will then look at some uh, models uh, that have been developed in some architectures that uh, tackle the problem of uh, semantic segmentation, like uh, fully convolutional networks, the UNET architecture, some uh, spatial uh, pyramid models. And we'll conclude with mask RCNN that brings together detection and segmentation in under a single framework. So semantic segmentation is a form of a dense prediction task. So we have seen previously that we have image classification where we have a, a label that describes uh, what's in the image, the whole image. We have detection where we isolate objects in, uh, in the image. And then uh, semantic segmentation uh, is basically uh, trying to classify every single pixel uh, in the image. There's also instance uh, segmentation that uh, attempts to only classify um, some particular objects, uh, the pixels of some particular objects in the image, and we will also uh, look at that. Semantic segmentation basically deals with the problem of um, labeling uh, each pixel in our image in one of um, uh, n number of uh, classes. So we want to group the pixels of an image together based uh, on the object class that they are located on. We previously saw that we could do this with uh, some features or color. In, uh, in this lecture, we will see how to solve this problem uh, with deep learning in a, um, through a machine learning uh, approach. This means uh, the main difference uh, and what it, it allows us to do, um, uh, basically, uh, when you have pixels of similar color, they may belong to different classes and we can differentiate uh, in this case. So in the figure, in the image that you see here, for example, uh, you have a color coded um, classification of, uh, of every pixel in the image. So um, trees and grass have a different color that corresponds to the class um, that they, they belong to. And this is basically uh, the input-output relationship that uh, a deep neural network will, uh, will predict. But first, uh, let's see some uh, applications as to why is this important? What, what new uh, abilities it provides us with response to, uh, to um, other methods like detection, for example? So the fact that we're able now to uh, detect or classify individual pixels in an image, um, as you may understand, it uh, raises a lot of uh, new capabilities. So we can apply this to um, aerial imaging or satellite imaging to classify uh, areas where are buildings, where are trees or roads, and this can help in uh, a number of different situations. When we have an emergency, for example, we can find routes where people can uh, travel from, or if you want to do some planning and you want to see what is the um, uh, 
uh, the number of buildings in the area, for example. Uh, also, semantic segmentation is quite uh, popular in autonomous driving. Uh, since we want to understand uh, everything that happens around the car, so pedestrians, roads, signs, and so on. And a lot of companies, um, they use the LiDAR that is also available in, in cars to um, make data sets for uh, semantic segmentation. And last but not least, we also have uh, medical applications uh, where we want to uh, find the malignant areas in a CT scan, for example. And uh, using these techniques, we can suggest to a doctor uh, that um, maybe we have to um, take a closer look at, uh, at an area. So the uh, input-output in this uh, uh, semantic segmentation process is uh, an image, an RGB image as we had before, or it could be a grayscale. Uh, and the output basically is uh, a segmentation mask um, um, where we have uh, at every pixel position, not uh, the color, but the class that uh, that pixel uh, belongs to. So um, if um, one, for example, is the number of the person, then particular pixels that correspond to that class Will, um, uh, will be um, uh, marked with uh, number one. And of course, to um, do this process in a, a through machine learning uh, method, uh, we need appropriate data sets to do it uh, in a supervised learning way. Uh, in the previous lecture, we saw that uh, COCO and VOC are two popular uh, data sets for detection. Uh, these same data sets also provide uh, data that can be used for segmentation. So they have uh, labeled images where each pixel in, in the image is labeled into one of uh, 20 or 80 classes, depending on the data set. And they can be used as ground truth so that we can train a model uh, to predict this, uh, these classes. So as you can understand, Labeling each individual pixel in the image is much more cumbersome than uh, classification, where you want to just add a label, or um, or detection, where you just uh, draw bounding box. This is a much more uh, tedious process. Uh, so it's more difficult in general to find uh, semantic segmentation data um, uh, that are annotated. So it's quite common to use uh, as we will see uh, in some of the other approaches, to use uh, um, more um, um, uh, augmentation uh, strategies so that we can increase uh, the size of our data sets and the variability. Uh, but um, um, one way to, uh, to do this is to apply augmentations, but one has to be uh, careful. In, uh, we, we cannot apply the same augmentations that we had before for the um, for the images. So, for example, uh, we could apply some uh, geometric augmentations to our input image. Uh, we, we need to also apply the same geometric operations to the uh, to the mask that has the um, class labels. And we want to do, to do that so that the um, spatial relationship with the input and output is uh, retained. Um, but if, for example, we apply some color transformation or some um, um, processing on the, the pixels that set themselves in the image, uh, we don't apply that transformation uh, on, the, on the label. So this is some uh, distinction that we have to uh, consider. For evaluating semantic segmentation, uh, we there are different metrics that are available. Some of the most common are um, the uh, mean IOU. So this is similar to the intersection of a union that we had for detection, uh, which is basically counts the uh, ratio of the overlaps between our masks and the prediction. Uh, but it's uh, done with uh, the pixel level information now instead of the bounding boxes. So in this case, we have 
um, we essentially apply uh, an end operation between the ground truth mask and the um, prediction. And um, basically, this means that uh, we only leave um, the area of the regions that overlap in these two uh, arrays. Um, and this is the denominator. And uh, we apply an OR operation to find the union. Uh, so basically, we whenever there is a class prediction, uh, we keep it and we find the or uh, the union of uh, of the two. And this gives us um, a relative uh, overlap between uh, the classes uh, for each uh, for the um, for the output. Uh, usually, this metric is reported for every class, uh, and it's good to show that because there might be cases where uh, some classes have less data than others, and so given the overall mean over union is uh, somewhat misleading. So it's good to report this for every class uh, and to find the common uh, and mean IOU just average over uh, those classes. Now, similarly, uh, and perhaps a bit more in a simpler way, we have uh, the pixel accuracy. So basically, what we do is we count uh, the number of pixels that were correctly classified. Uh, and this is a, a valid metric, but again, um, when we have imbalances in the number of um, uh, classes, this can be uh, problematic. Now let's briefly talk about uh, some more classical methods that have been used before uh, deep learning became more mainstream. Um, uh, these methods, as we saw in, in previous lectures, relied on uh, um, image processing techniques and, and good features to find similar regions. Um, so, for example, in gray level uh, segmentation, we could assign um, some hard-coded rules by which we uh, mark two areas are similar or not, for example, the grayscale level. Um, and then we assign for similar regions a particular label. But as you can imagine, this is uh, very restrictive um, when we consider more uh, simpler cases. Uh, and we want to move on to more uh, complex patterns and distinguish based on, on classes. Some other methods that are still uh, used today are uh, conditional random fields. Um, unlike more uh, traditional classifiers, this method um, can consider the uh, neighboring, neighboring between uh, the pixels. So they consider the relationship between the pixels to classify uh, a region. Um, and as an intuition, um, if you look at this image, um, for example, we have uh, a more classical um, uh, approach applied and we get um, an image um, uh, like the third image. As you can see, there are many dots that are like uh, noisy because we only look at uh, local context, whereas um, if we apply a method like a conditional uh, random field that considers what is happening around some of the pixels, we get a much uh, more continuous and smooth uh, prediction. So as an intuition, um, conditional random fields um, are um, graph-based methods. So they have, um, uh, they consider some linkage between uh, the neighbors. Uh, and they consider the cost of um, assigning a particular label uh, to, um, to one of the pixels. Uh, and they can also, at the same time, consider the um, pairwise cost or, or uh, multi-assignment cost between um, pixels that are uh, nearby. So if we visualize it uh, connectivity-wise, for example, at the top case, 
um, each pixel is, is connected to uh, four of its neighbors, and um, a prediction is made uh, based on uh, solving uh, an optimization assignment problem. So the problem is, um, what is the cost of assigning a label um, to the center pixel to its end to each one of these neighbors collectively? And you can solve it using a standard uh, optimization algorithms. Uh, and uh, the connectivity pattern that you consider, so how many neighbors you consider affects um, the final result, as you can imagine. So uh, in the top case, we have a very rough estimate of the boundaries, but uh, the more neighbors, the, the more connected, the more dense uh, our model, then we can have much uh, finer details captured. So this is a, as an intuition of uh, how the connectivity between these models um, impacts uh, the result. And as I said, these were more used before introducing uh, deep learning methods. Um, and these classical methods, um, uh, we ne really need to find, uh, more, we're more involved in finding uh, some uh, right features and um, what spatial relationships to consider between uh, pixels. A major breakthrough, breakthrough came in around 2014, one of, the, one of the first works to use a convolutional neural network for um, semantic segmentation. Uh, and since then, uh, people have started to use deep learning uh, for semantic segmentation as it has um, simplified somewhat uh, the process of semantic segmentation as we just uh, need to collect some data and then we can train uh, we can train a model so if we look at the main difference between uh, a single label uh, classification with deep learning and uh, semantic segmentation uh, is that we have many more uh, outputs than in a single um, uh, label classification problem. So essentially here, what we're doing is we are building a classifier for each uh, for each of the pixels in the image. So typically, um, um, in a single label classification task, we represent our output in a one-hot encoded fashion. Um, and um, in, uh, in semantic segmentation, since we have as many classifiers as the um, the size of the image, the, its height and width, we basically represent all each of these um, labels as one hot encoded vectors that correspond to um, uh, to the number of classes. So we have uh, as many outputs as the number of classes. And uh, each of these outputs has a size of width and height, which is the same as the image. Uh, a distinction here that is important. So some people may uh, use the number of classes to, um, um, to uh, say that, uh, um, to, to include only the classes that we're predicting, but we can also have one class uh, for the background, which just changes the number of outputs. But it's important to consider when you're reading a paper or uh, when you're looking to build one of your uh, own semantic segmentation networks to also have an additional output for the background class. So we have now um, the output that we want to predict is this one hot encoded uh, tensor for each pixel. Let's try and, and intuitively find some ways of uh, using what we have at the moment with deep learning to uh, make it predict this particular uh, output. So one uh, naive approach would be to use um, the same network that we have. So for example, to get a VGG or a ResNet uh, to predict a class for every pixel by using it in a sliding window uh, fashion. That is, uh, we uh, crop parts of the image and we classify them 
based on what is the, the class of the center pixel in that, uh, in that location. As you can imagine, this can be uh, rather inefficient because um, we are not uh, reusing uh, the features uh, that could be the same between the crops. And at the same time, uh, the context may be missing because we're looking at only smaller uh, crops in the image. So it's very uh, inefficient. So we need to do something more uh, specialized. So one uh, possible idea would be to um, classify all the pixels um, and have as an output the uh, of the network or the, the whole image with uh, the classifications. So we design a network with uh, only convolutional layers and we make predictions for all pixels uh, at once. Uh, and ideally we want uh, this to happen at the full resolution of the image, but as you can imagine, um, performing all the convolutions at uh, the input size of the image can be very uh, expensive in terms of uh, computation and memory that uh, we need to store um, all this data. So, so the solution is um, to design a network um, as a bunch of uh, convolutional layers with uh, some dumps, downsampling layers. Uh, and then upscale those feature maps uh, inside the network so we can reach the, um, um, the size of the image that we want to predict. So we can have uh, a very similar um, downsampling um, component in the network, like uh, with pooling and striding uh, convolutions to reduce the size of the input. Uh, and then what we need is a mechanism to project those features that we have at the um, um, inner layers of the network to um, uh, to reach the size of the, the image. And uh, for that, we need to introduce some new layers actually to um, upscale and upsample the feature maps. So this type of uh, architecture with um, the downsampling part and the upsampling part is uh, called uh, an encoder uh, decoder uh, network or an encoder decoder architecture. And it's a rather uh, generic architecture that can have uh, many different uh, uses, as we will also see in uh, the next lecture. So it's comprised of these two parts. We have the encoder that takes uh, in, um, the image as an input, and um, it generates a high dimensional feature vector at its output. And it's a typical feature extractor that we saw in the previous uh, lectures, as with uh, very similar to what we have in uh, classification tasks, for example. So it essentially encodes um, the image pixels into some higher level representation that is more compact and uh, usually has a reduced spatial uh, resolution. Now the new part that we introduce is this decoder uh, network that aims to uh, take that um, internal representation, the uh, learned representation from the encoder and decode it and project it into uh, the semantic uh, pixel space. In other words, to uh, upscale it to the size of the image, but uh, maintain the semantic information, the, the pixel level um, labels. So um, overall, we have the encoder that reduces the spatial dimensions and the decoder that wants to uh, increase the spatial dimensions, but uh, retaining all the semantic information that has been uh, learned through the encoder. Now, more visually, this um, looks something like this. This is an, an encoder uh, decoder uh, example. 
So we have the encoder part, which uh, through operations like uh, max pooling and stridded convolutions um, reduces the spatial resolution of the input. Uh, and it learns to extract features and uh, that summarize the image contents in a uh, one-dimensional vector representation. On the other hand, the decoder takes uh, that feature vector and transform, transforms it uh, by increasing its uh, spatial resolution. Uh, and uh, we will see some techniques on uh, what kinds of operations have this effect. Uh, and it can also use uh, convolution to um, merge some uh, features together to uh, extract um, more semantic information. So the overall goal of uh, semantic segmentation uh, and the decoder in particular is to go from these coarse features that are learned by the um, encoder into a representation that uh, describes um, the semantic information at each pixel and produces uh, more fine-grained uh, predictions. Now, there are several forms of uh, encoder and coder algorithms, um, but they all follow um, this similar pattern of um, um, repeated convolutions and downscaling. Uh, operations. And again, we have the decoder that has some sort of upsampling, a way of upscaling these uh, features, and um, is comprised of also repeated convolutions to increase the spatial uh, resolution. So now let's, let's have a closer look at uh, the operations that uh, happen within the decoder and help to increase the spatial resolution of the feature maps. And uh, it, this is what, at the end of the day, allows us to have semantic segmentation information uh, at the image level. So the main issue we have to deal uh, in the decoder is how to increase the feature map size. Uh, and we will see next a few ways um, to, to, to do just this. So we want to uh, reach from a, a lower level representation up, up to the size um, of the image. As we require to predict the values of each pixel, uh, and so we need to increase the height and width of the uh, feature map that is extracted from the encoder. So we can do that uh, through uh, what is called unpooling and convolution. Uh, we have um, a method that is called transpose convolution or deconvolution. Uh, and we also have upsampling layers followed by convolution. And here you see some um, examples. So um, and we will go through each of these uh, in more detail. So let's start from the unpooling um, operations. But first, um, let's think of a simpler solution. One simpler solution would be, as you see on the image on the top, uh, when we have, for example, this uh, four, four, uh, two by two uh, matrix to just add zeros around each of these numbers. Now, this manages to um, upscale the feature map but we lose the relative information and location uh, between these values. So they do not correspond to that well to the initial uh, downsampling operation. So an improvement on this is uh, what we call as unpooling, um, which relies basically on remembering the locations um, that um, happened during the downsampling process and use the same indices to project the values back to where they were, where they came from. So this results in an uh, upsampling um, method that respects the original um, um, location of these values. Uh, 
and it's allow it, it retains details much better than uh, rather a more um, naive approach. But um, notice here that this approach does not use anything that is learned. So we just reuse the same indices that we uh, that came out during the max pooling operation. So this the downside of this approach is that we are not doing this uh, through learnable parameters. And we will see how we can, um, of course, do this through uh, deconvolution. This is a more um, detailed example of uh, what we had before. So again, demonstrating this concept of unpooling. Um, so in the so in the in the encoder, if we have this four by four input, and we get uh, this two by two output, uh, we just store the indices that correspond to the uh, maximum values, and we just propagate them back into the um, respective inverse layer in the encoder, and so we just place these values at the same location. Uh, that uh, were generated through the max pooling. And this is called max unpooling. So uh, we're just finding corresponding pairs of uh, down sampling and up sampling layers. We propagate the indices and we have the um, uh, increase in scale of the feature map. Now, uh, the learnable up sampling process uh, I to do that in a way that uh, uses learned weights is called transpose convolution or de deconvolution. Uh, it, has, it has different names, um, but it's quite uh, similar to traditional convolution. So in a traditional convolution, we produce uh, a single value for each area that uh, the filter is applied. On the other hand, in the a transpose convolution or deconvolution, we have uh, a single value. Uh, and uh, we want to produce a set of values uh, corresponding to the size of our kernel. So basically, we are broca broadcasting this single value through the kernel to obtain uh, more values. And a more a uh, detailed example uh, can be shown uh, here that is a bit more concrete. So uh, here, for example, we have this uh, two by two input and we want to um, process it through tra transposed convolution with the two by two uh, kernel. So we take uh, the each values from the input and we multiply them with each value in the kernel. So this results in um, four different matrices. And uh, by summing them together, we get the output. So it's quite similar to traditional convolution, but instead of, uh, we, but we, what we do instead is we broadcast each value of the input uh, through the kernel. And we, in, in this way, we multiply the number of uh, outputs. Of course, uh, even, um, we can also have some padding with the input and we have some striding of the kernel. And this also play um, a role in um, what type of output we get. But we'll provide more uh, details in the, uh, in the next slides. So here is uh, a visualization of what happens during the transpose convolution um, from a perspective of um, a single value in the input, we again distribute that through the kernel and we obtain um, a summation of the uh, intermediate results. And this gives us uh, a much larger output. So this example here uh, shows you how we can generate a, a, from a two by two uh, input, a four by four output. So we double the spatial resolution 
But one thing uh, to notice, if you look also in the animation, the output, um, there are some cases where the kernel overlaps with uh, some pixels more often than others in the output. And this can generate some, uh, some problems. So we call this um, we call these effects artifacts. So um, uh, this is caused basically when we have an even overlap between um, uh, the pattern of the kernel when it's applied over the input image. So whenever the the kernel size is not divisible by the the stride, the distance between the application of different kernels then we get these artifacts. But uh, it's easier to understand it here with uh, in a one dimensional uh, setting. So let's say we have this, uh, this kernel here, a one dimensional uh, a signal, and uh, we apply a kernel of three with a stride of three. As you can see, the uh, outputs do not have any uh, overlap. If we, on the other hand, decrease the stride and make it less than the size of the kernel, then um, you see that th there are some areas where the outputs overlap. And this, in turn, um, if you look at it in the, in the 2D case, um, there are some areas that um, we have many more values than others. So th this creates some um, artifacts in our feature maps for uh, in the image. But uh, it's, this is best demonstrated, I think, through um, when looking at uh, uh, in uh, real images. So as you can see here, uh, in the top row is uh, we use um, this deconvolution with uh, um, different uh, ratio between the kernel and the stride. And as you can see, we have this checkerboard um, artifacts. Um, and people have started to notice this, um, this, uh, this um, artifacts and uh, try to find ways of um, uh, of combining them. So they could, um, um, as we will see later on, they can lead to um, bad uh, results in terms of uh, quality. So another method proposed beyond the transpose convolution. Uh, is to separate the upsampling from the convolution. So deconvolution does this uh, upsampling and convolution in one go. Uh, people have started to look at ways to do them separately. So we have first do an upsampling using uh, an interpolation method like a nearest neighbor or bilinear interpolation. And then uh, we do a convolution as normal um, um, on the output. And this seems like a more natural approach than a traditional uh, deconvolution. And as you can see uh, at the bottom, uh, this results in more, much smoother images with uh, less noise and less artifacts. So this is another approach, a third approach towards uh, upsampling the feature maps. Now that we have seen uh, some ways of uh, designing the decoder, uh, let's consider how we can train a network um, in an end-to-end -end fashion to uh, given an image to predict uh, the segmentation output. So for this, we need to define uh, a loss function. The loss function would tell us um, how good is our uh, prediction with respect to the ground truth. Uh, since now we're having, instead of just one classification, um, we're not doing a single label classification, um, we have instead uh, multiple classifiers for each pixel. Um, our loss function is the, um, uh, the averaging or the combination of the uh, predictions for all the pixels in the image. So we take as uh, ground truth, the mask uh, of the segmentation, which looks uh, similar to this uh, array on the on the right. So at some particular, so for each class we have uh, one array, and uh, uh, for each class in its corresponding array we mark with uh, one 
the uh, regions that, that correspond to that class in the image. So uh, for bicycle, for example, we will have uh, the ones in the array corresponding uh, to the bicycle. And if you want to uh, find the mask of the person, this, this pixels will have the value of one in a different uh, in a different array. So if you look at these um, uh, for each uh, row wise for it, for all the channels uh, at one particular location, it basically is a one hundred coded uh, vector for every pixel. So this in turn. Um, makes it easy to use what we know about uh, classification uh, with uh, uh, for every pixel in the image. So uh, we basically do um, a pixel wise uh, softmax, softmax and apply a cross entropy for all the pixels uh, in the image. So the same uh, classification loss that we had for a single label classification task, we can use it here for um, for segmentation. The only difference is that we get many more outputs which correspond to the size of the image. Um, a couple of details here. We, again, as I said, we format the output in a one-hot encoding. So that is for every, uh, for every pixel value, we have one only at the location of the pixel that uh, it corresponds to that class, uh, and it makes um, it makes it easier if we can visualize what's going on by assigning for every class uh, some mapping, so uh, one particular color color for each uh, class. Uh, and we can also use it later on to verify uh, some results. So using this one hot encoding vector and the cross entropy laws, we can train. Uh, a semantic segmentation network pretty much in the same way that we trained um, a single uh, label classification network. Now the major uh, problem and the difference is that we have, we could have uh, many more examples of uh, let's say the background class than with respect to the uh, to the class of, that corresponds to a person. So many more pixels will belong to background rather than um, to individual objects. Uh, as a result, it's uh, quite easy if we don't take care of this for the network to focus only on the background class and classify all the pixels essentially as background. So um, the way that we can deal with this is to introduce uh, some uh, different losses that uh, basically try and um, mitigate uh, this problem. So one loss in particular that can be used is uh, is the focal loss. This is uh, a loss that we saw in the previous lecture for object detection. Uh, and because it's a similar problem, um, we can apply it here to basically reduce the impact that well-classified uh, samples have. So as we can see in the example here, so uh, if we have um, uh, a model with 80% um, uh, confidence for a particular pixel, that gives you a corresponding loss value of 0 0.3, uh, which still has some effect on the updating of the weights. Uh, what the focal loss does, basically, it dampens down the impact that that uh, sample will have. So when we apply the loss with some particular number of the uh, parameter gamma, um, uh, uh, the same output of a uh, 0 0.8 would have almost zero loss. Uh, so it doesn't add anything into the into the loss in in, in, in the same way. It's not going to affect the updating of the weights. Uh, on the other hand, the um, values that will affect the updating of the weights are the ones that have a low probability. So there's no the classification is not um, confident. Uh, in that respect, uh, they are the only samples that will affect the updating of the weights. And so we say that in, in focal loss, um, it uh, makes it easier for the classification process to focus on the 
uh, values are uh, misclassified or not classified confidently. And this pixel um, and this loss can be applied um, to all, all the pixels together. Another popular loss for semantic segmentation is uh, what we call uh, the dice loss. It is another loss that attempts to tackle this problem of uh, class imbalance. It uses what we call uh, the soft uh, dice score instead of the pixel-wise cross entropy. Uh, and if you look closely, this coefficient, this uh, soft dice score, is uh, looks pretty much like a, a intersection of a union um, uh, overlap uh, metric. So we have on top the uh, multiplication between the pixel class that's predicted and the ground truth. And uh, on the bottom we have the, uh, their summation. So it's like uh, uh, um, a relative overlap uh, metric. Um, and the loss is one minus that. One note here for uh, the dice loss is that it gives a very weird uh, derivative. So the loss function, uh, basically, we take the derivative of the loss function so that we can update the weights. Uh, but the problem is that because this loss function has these uh, squarings and the denominator, uh, it makes things really weird during training. So some, uh, if you have some really small values, then uh, the, this component can become large and vice versa. So it's a bit unstable uh, during training. And another thing is because it's so unstable, it doesn't show you, uh, it doesn't indicate that well the performance of the network. So you have to uh, also consider having a validation accuracy metric. So just uh, to see how the net network is uh, is doing. But um, even um, if, if these losses seem a bit uh, too difficult, you, you can also uh, again use uh, the standard cross entropy and just uh, weigh the classes um, that are more prominent with uh, a lower weight. So that's you, in, in that way you can again balance uh, the different uh, uh, mitigate the problem of uh, of class imbalancing. So now we have our um, loss functions. We have our main components. Let's just go see how we can start to build this encoder decoder network in in some more detail. So the first thing we will look at is the uh, encoder part. So the encoder part uh, usually is um, a network that is already pre-trained on ImageNet. This is a uh, common practice. Uh, and we just take those weights and use them as the encoder. And uh, what we are building from then on is the decoder part. And uh, this makes sense if the labels and the classes that we'll have, we find in ImageNet or any other data set are similar to what we expect to find in our semantic segmentation task. So if we have uh, in ImageNet, we have um, images of cars and we want to train an autonomous uh, vehicle segmentation model, then it makes sense to use those weights. Otherwise, uh, it might not help to pre-train uh, the network. So we can use essentially for the encoder any network um, that we had um, previously um, for classification. So we could use uh, VDG or ResNet and just um, fine tune it for the segmentation task. One way we could make a choice um, based, um, based on the network is um, with respect to what we want from the application. Is it uh, an embedded application that we might look at the memory or uh, the parameters 
or if it's a, it needs to run in real time, uh, then we can have a look at the inference time of that uh, particular backbone. Uh, if we're on the other hand interested only in a cloud application, then it might make sense to look at the classification error and get the one that is uh, most accurate. But there are different choices involved in selecting your um, your encoder. Now, similarly for the decoding part, which is the more uh, specialized, um, we can have a look at uh, we can use the same uh, strategies that we have for the um, for the encoder, so we could have something in the style of VGG where we have uh, su successive convolutional layers. Or we could have something more complex like uh, an inception module or we have the, we can have this. Um, um, uh, this uh, ResNet like. Um, uh, output uh, and also what we want to change here is the. Um, uh, the way that we have sampled uh, the feature maps. One other thing with regards to the ResNet is that uh, we have to also take care that the feature maps have the same size in terms of spatial dimensions and channels so that we can um, sum them together. 